she was awarded the Wyoming Arts Council Fellowship in both 1996 and 2006. And today she's going to speak with us to help us understand the how of the meaning of poetry uh, in her presentation entitled, So, What Makes Poetry Work? or Poetry. I just don't understand it. I think we'll learn to understand it. Dr. Wall, welcome. Good morning. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here, and I'd really like to thank the Humanities Council and UW and Sheridan College for allowing me this opportunity. Um, it's, it's interesting to talk about poetry because you get several kinds of responses, but lots of people say, well, I don't know what poems mean. Well, I'm going to talk about it a little bit differently today because I'm not going to talk about meaning particularly. Um, so much depends upon the best words in their best order. And so much depends upon, for those of you who have seen the handout already, is the first line of the first poem that I'm going to talk about, but you don't have to turn to it now. And, and the, the handouts are simply for your reference. Um, the phrase, the best words in their best order, comes from Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who is an English romantic poet um, right, living in the beginning of the 19th century. And he says, I wish our clever young poets would remember my homely definitions of prose and poetry. That, that is, prose, words in their best order. Poetry, the best words in their best order. And this is really important because it's a difference of one word. He puts best in again. And what that does is that makes us think about actual word choice. Prose is the words in their best order, nice, tidy sentences. But poetry takes us somewhere else. But before we get to poetry, I want to go to painting. This is a painting by John Constable, uh, English 19th century English painter. Um, and the reason I want to do this is because I think that most people, when they, when they talk about poetry, jump to meaning too quickly. Now, I know that sounds, that sounds difficult, but they jump to meaning too quickly. What's this poem mean? No, I want people to think about poems the way we think about paintings. Nobody would look at this painting and go, what does this painting mean? This painting is an aesthetic and emotional experience. We walk into the painting. We see the way he's used light and color. You see the way he has attended to the reflection in the water. We see the row of ducks. We see the cows. It is a, an aesthetic experience. It is also an emotional experience. We feel the, the bucolic quality. We feel the peace of this picture. When we think about, I want to think about poetry the way we think about painting. Experience the emotional and the aesthetic first. Once you've done that, then you get to meaning. But, but, but it's important to think about that aesthetic experience. Here's another example. We don't have to say anything about what this painting means. But what we do feel, the emotional experience, is very clear. We feel it. And, and obviously, then we can talk about the aesthetics of how he's done what he's done. He has all these screaming people around the edges of the painting. He has these dramatic diagonals in the middle of the painting. But, but we don't go, this painting means this. We, we get it. Um, this is, as you probably all know, Guernica and, and commemorates the bombing of the village of Guernica in Spain by the Republican um, armies in the Spanish Civil War. But, but we have the, ex the experience is emotional and aesthetic first. Okay. So in painting, we look at line, color, contrast, shape, 
focus. In poetry, we think about image, word choice, sound, and figurative language. And all of these things create the emotional and aesthetic experience. Once you've got there, then you get to the, the meaning if you want to, but, but, but these things create the experience. So this is one of the most enigmatic poems in English. <laughs> Um, it's William Carlos Williams. William Carlos Williams was a pediatrician um, working in Rutherford, New Jersey in the early part of the 20th century. He belonged to a school of poets called modernists. He also belonged to a school called imagists. And imagists concentrate on image. William Carlos Williams is famous for saying, no ideas but in things. If you can't give me an image, for what you're trying to say, you don't have an idea, is basically what he's saying. No ideas, but in things. So don't give me big abstract words. I don't know what they're about. If you want to talk about love, show me that woman in her nightgown. Uh, right? OK. You want to talk about patriotism? Show me a soldier. But don't just say patriotism. Big abstract word. Doesn't have any place in poetry at all. OK, so let's look at this one. If we take off the enigmatic first four words, so much depends upon, I'll get there, um, the rest of it is a beautiful, clear image. A red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. You can see it. It's clear. There is nothing fancy here. What's the most important word? in this poem. You don't, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to, because I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. But, but the most important word here is glazed. Why? Why is that the most important word in this poem? Because when we think about glazed, we think about a large collection of connotations. It is surrounded by meaning, this word. He didn't say wet with rainwater. He didn't say slippery. He didn't say dripping. He said glazed. And when we think about glazed, we think about pottery. We think about people who work with glass. It's hard. It's a hard surface. So what William Carlos Williams has done is turned that red wheelbarrow into an artifact. So once, once we start talking about artifacts and we look at red wheelbarrows that, that are solid and hard, could be dug up out of some archaeological site, and chickens, then we're beginning to talk about agriculture. We're beginning to talk about human civilization. We're beginning to talk about a really big picture in a tiny, tiny little poem. So once you think about that red wheelbarrow as an artifact, and once you think about those chickens as part of human civilization, then we can go back to that enigmatic first line. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow, glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Human civilization depends on the red wheelbarrow, glazed with rainwater. So he's taken this tiny little image and then blown it up so that it's really enormous. And, and this is part of the experience of poetry, is slowing yourself down as you read the poem so that you pay attention to word choice. Glazed is the most important word in this poem, and he did it deliberately. But if you just sort of read it quickly, you miss that. So one of the tricks for poetry is to slow down. Word choice is critical. OK, I'm going to look at another poem. And I'm only giving you the first two lines. And you don't have to look at your, don't look at your handouts, because it's in there. But. OK, this is another example of a tiny little poem where word choice 
is critical. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. Okay, very um, sort of sort of domestic, homely sort of image. It is a, it is a, a simile. But when we think about a hook and eye, we either think of that latch that you can latch a gate with or that little tiny fastener that goes on the top of a blouse. They're both very commonplace objects. And this is a mildly sexual reference. I mean, that's, there's, it's kind of, it's got some of that implication there. Now, Margaret Atwood, who is a Canadian poet, does something else. She takes us to another place. Yeah, a fish hook and open eye. She sets us up with this little sort of very commonplace simile and then hits us in the stomach. <laughs> you know, you're all cringing. This is horrible, right? And, and so, but all she did was add two words. Two words, hit fish and open. That's the only new word in the entire, those are the only new words in the entire poem. So word choice is absolutely critical. So when you're reading poetry, pay attention to the words. Pay attention to the additions and the subtractions that a poet has made. Okay. After Apple Picking by Robert Frost. My long two-pointed ladders sticking through a tree toward heaven still. And there is a barrel that I didn't fill beside it, and there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night, the scent of apples, I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight, I got from looking through a pane of glass, I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough, and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break, but I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, with every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of the ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking, I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were ten thousand thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. Okay. How did this poem make you feel? And what words on the page produced that feeling? This is a poem that anybody who's done any sort of repetitive work can understand. You drive for 14 hours, you get to a motel, you lie down in bed, you close your eyes, and you see the road, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I worked on a dish line in college, and I had to take glasses off the trays and put them into a rack. And Saturday nights, I would go home, I would go to sleep, and I would dream about those damn glasses. <laughs> so, 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 yes. So, Robert Frost is talking about exactly the same thing in this poem. He is done with apple picking now. Here is a man who is trying to go to sleep. And those apples are plaguing him all through the poem. He is uncomfortable. He is shifting around. You can, you can feel him rolling around in his bed. But how does the poet get there? What are the actual techniques that he uses to get us that sort of feeling of unease, which the poem really creates? 
but it isn't about meaning exactly. It is about what the words on the page do. So I'm going to talk about two poetic devices in this poem, rhyme and alliteration. There are other things I could talk about, but these are the two dominant ones in this poem. And alliteration is simply repeated consonant sounds. My two-pointed, my long two-pointed ladder sticking through a tree toward heaven still. And there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it. And there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough, but I am done with apple picking now. OK, what makes us uneasy about this, this part of the poem? Normally, when we, when we think about rhyme, we would think about something like my long two-pointed ladder sticking through a tree toward heaven still, and then the next line would rhyme with tree. But he doesn't do that. And he gives us a long line, my long two-pointed ladder sticking through a tree toward heaven still, and that's a short line, and that's awkward. And there's a barrel that I didn't fill, and that's, wait, that shouldn't, that, that rhyme is off, beside it, and there may be two or three, and then we get the rhyme with tree. And, and so right away, at the beginning of the poem, we're off balance. Then he gives us a couplet, apples I didn't pick upon some bough, but I am done with apple picking now. Now a couplet ties up a, a stanza or a poem nice, nicely and neatly. So we've got this really rocky rhyme. Then we've got this couplet that says I am done with apple picking now. OK, let's look at another example. It melted, and I let it fall and break, but I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Again, we've got that rocky rhyme. We have break, and then we have well, and then we have fell, and then we have tell, and then we get the rhyme with break. And it's like, as readers, our ears are going, what? What? Please give me that rhyme. And, and then he throws in some other things. We've got melted and fall in that first line, which are almost rhymes with well, fell, and tell. So it melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my, sleep, upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell. So the, the way he has structured the poem gives us the emotional um, response, the emotional feeling in the poem, it is really rocky. Okay. I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were 10,000 thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down, not let fall for all that struck the earth. There again, we have that awkward rhyme, but the, here is the only place in the entire poem where he chooses multi-syllable words to rhyme, overtired and desired. All of his other rhymes are one syllable, fall, all, well, tell, all of those, but overtired and desired. And they are contradictions. If you are overtired, you do not desire something. I have had too much of apple picking. You know, it's just like, please, can I just go to sleep? <laughs> right? I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. And so it's the only place where he does this with a couplet that is multi-syllable words. But again, he makes us dwell on those words because they are multi-syllable words. He makes us think about them. So he uses rhyme in a very peculiar way, but it is exactly, it ev evokes exactly the emotional quality that he wants. So what else makes us feel this poem? Think about the dominant sound in this passage. The essence of winter sleep is on the night. The scent of apples, I am drowsing off. 
I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. The S is dominant. The S is dominant all the way through. What does that sound evoke in us emotionally? You know, it's a soft sound. It can be, it, and it can be comforting. He comes back to the same sound right at the end of the poem. But the soft sound, it's sort of a, a, a sweet breeze moving through the poem. I'm drowsing off cannot rub the strangeness from my sight. That dominant S all the way through that, that soft sound. It's, it's gentle, but it's also a little bit ominous. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. Think about the dominant sounds in that passage. We've got all of those percussive consonants. We've got the B's and the D's and, and the M's and the P's. And we hear those apples. It's not just a picture of those apples. It's an auditory experience of those apples rumbling in. And rumbling is a word that is onomatopoetic. That is, it sounds like what it means, rumbling. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. So he lets those hard consonants dominate, and we hear those apples. We don't just see them, we hear them. And this is the last, the last section of the poem. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. <coughs> now, again, the S is dominant, and that's that soft, that soft S. But the other thing that happens at this end of this poem is that we've got weird rhymes happening on gone it is his but 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 the last line doesn't rhyme with anything it rhymes with cider apple heap about 10 lines before but we forgot that and and so and so the last line doesn't rhyme he's fallen asleep he's not finishing the idea he's he's done he's fallen asleep some human sleep and so Frost has done some really interesting things in structuring this poem to make us really feel what's happening in the poem, to, to provide us with this really clear aesthetic experience. OK, the next thing I'd like to talk about is figurative language. And most of you are familiar with the term simile and metaphor, I'm sure. Um, but a simile is simply a comparison that uses like or as. My love is like a red, red rose. We all know this. Uh, a metaphor is my love is a rose. Um, no um, like or as in the middle. And, and one of the things that poets do, I used to think that everybody thought this way, but I, I've come to the conclusion that maybe not. But poets think in metaphor. We can't help it. We think in metaphor. Um, but human beings use figurative language all the time. You can say it's pouring rain, or you can say it's raining cats and dogs. And, and one is figurative and one is literal. Um, poets will, uh, I often think that the, the job of the poet is to try to put into words things that you can't put into words. So we're always creating a metaphor. It's like, OK, I'm trying to say this, but I'll do it like this. I'll tell you what it's like. I, I, I don't, you know, that it's, I'm trying to grab something, but poets also often create a whole poem that is a metaphor. And we're going to look at a couple of those. 
And this is a poem by Anne Bradstreet, and you can tell by her dates that she's old. Anne Bradstreet was a Puritan poet living in Boston. She came over on the Constance with the Puritans. The Puritans, unlike the Pilgrims, were often very, very well educated. Bradstreet was 18, but she had received a classical education in her father's house in England before she came to Boston in the 17th century, which must have been a shock. Um, you know, a bunch of log huts. Um, and, and she continued to write. She wrote poems. And um, one of her relatives, a brother-in-law, uh, managed to steal <laughs> her manuscript <laughs> and take it to England to be published. And so she is writing this poem, the author to her book. Now, she tells us exactly what she's writing about. But look at the metaphor she develops. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends, less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. At thy return, my blushing was not small, my rambling brat in print, should mother call. I cast thee by as one unfit for light. The visage was so irksome in my sight. Yet being mine own, at length, affection would thy blemishes amend. So if I could, I washed thy face, but more defects I saw. Rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. I stretched thy joints to make thee even feet. Yet still thou runnest more hobbling than is meet. In better dress to trim thee was my mind but not save homespun cloth in the house I find. In this array amongst vulgars mayst thou roam. In critics' hands beware thou, thou dost not come, and take thy way where, there, where yet thou art not known. As for thy father, as if were thy father asked, say thou hast none, as, and for thy mother, she alas is poor, which caused her thus to send thee out the door. <laughs> okay. We laugh, we laugh at this poem, we chuckle at this poem. She's developing this wonderful metaphor, absolutely delightful metaphor. But she does some things that are interesting because she sticks to facts, like um, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge. Paper was made of rags. So he turned it into rags to the press. Um, she has this wonderful line, I stretched thy joints to make thee even feet, yet still thou runst more hobbling than is meet. We're talking about poetic feet here, and poetic feet um, are, they're just measures of cadence or meter. So da-da, 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 um, and, and da-da is a foot. So she's making a pun on feet and poetic feet here. Um, you know, in this array amongst vul vulgars may thou roam, among the people, but please stay away from critics. <laughs> okay, if asked for, if for thy father asked, say thou hast none. Now she's told us that in the beginning, thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain. This is a fatherless child, but the fatherless child in, in the 17th century was considered an orphan, so, so she's playing with this idea, this orphan book going out there. And, and so she's, it's, it's clever, and it's funny, and it's almost falsely modest. Because she's saying, you know, I really can do this. I really can write. And, and actually, it's not so bad that those poems got printed. You know, as a 17th century woman, she probably couldn't have gotten her book printed, but some, you know, friend, till snatched from thence, by, from thence by friends less wise than true. Uh, true friends, but not very wise, but okay. And, and so she's really just developed this metaphor of the child. And so the little places where um, rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. Well, if you have a piece of paper and you erase something, it's still, there's still a flaw there. And, and we've all, or at least those of us who are mothers, have you know, washed our children's faces. My aunt once said, I will not have my face washed with spit. <laughs> but we've done it. We've all done it. So here's Anne Bradstreet talking about 
you know, making more of a mess by trying to erase the flaws on her book. Here's another metaphor, and we get it. Um, Langston Hughes was a member of the Harlem Renaissance, writing um, in the early part of the 20th century. He died about 1967. Um, mother to son. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it, and splinters, and boards torn up, and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I's been climbing on, and reaching landings, and turning corners, and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back, because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you set down on the steps, because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now. I's still going, honey. I still climbing, and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. And one of the things that happens in poetry is if you give the reader a negative, the positive also appears in the reader's mind. I say to you, don't think about elephants. What happened? OK. <laughs> exactly. So he says, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Well, we see the crystal stair. We see it. And then he gives us this wonderful description of a tenement house staircase. Tax, splinters, boards, no carpet on the floor, all that. But we know it's a metaphor. She's not really talking about the stairs in her apartment building. Really not. But the whole poem develops this metaphor of life equals staircase. <laughs> and so rather than just say, you know, it's really hard to grow up in Harlem, Langston Hughes did this. And we get it. Um, I have taught this poem many times, and I had a, a young student once who was 17 and pregnant and unmarried, and we were talking about this poem, and she printed it out and framed it and hung it on her son's wall. <laughs> and that son is now 13, and that's still there. So um, we do have an influence. This one's a little trickier, because she doesn't tell us. She tells us it's metaphors. Sylvia Plath is another 20th century American poet, mostly famous because she committed suicide. Uh, but um, So she tells us it's metaphors, but she doesn't tell us anything else. We don't, not the author to her book, not a lecture from a mother to a son. I am a riddle in nine syllables, an elephant, a ponderous house, a melon strolling on two tendrils, oh, red fruit ivory, fine timbers. This loaf's big with its yeasty rising. Money's new minted in this fat purse. I'm a means, a stage, a cow and calf. I've eaten a bag of green apples, boarded a train. There's no getting off. Think about it. I'm a riddle in nine syllables. There are nine lines in this poem. Why is the number nine significant in human life? Yes. Yes, each line is a metaphor for pregnancy. A cow and calf. I've eaten a bag of green apples. You know, boarded train, there's no getting off because, you know, if you have that kid, there's no getting off. And they don't come with manuals. She's just playing, but each line is a metaphor for pregnancy. And, and she, you know, and, and she was playing, so each line has nine syllables and there are nine lines. But but it takes a little work to get here. So unlike Bradstreet and Langston Hughes, who tell us right away what they're talking about, Plath is a little bit more um, tricky. Explain those green apples. Morning sick. Oh. 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 No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> How about the red fruit, ivory, fine timbers? Oh, that's the, the, the uterus and the bones and stuff in there. OK. You have to use your imaginations a little bit. OK, I have one more poem to talk about. I love this poem. This poem combines a lot of what I've been talking about today. And this is why I wanted to end with this one, um, because it does contain alliteration, and it contains figurative language. And so the hard, a hardware store as proof of the existence of God. <laughs> and, and, and you know, nobody else 
has ever thought of that title, except Nancy Willard. You know. I praise the brightness of hammers pointing east like the steel woodpeckers of the future, and dozens of hinges opening brass wings, and six new rakes shyly fanning their toes, and bins of hooks glittering into bees and a rack of wrenches like the long bones of horses, and mailboxes sewing rows of silver chapels, and a company of plungers waiting for God to claim their thin legs in their big shoes and put them on and walk away laughing. In a world not perfect, but not bad either, let there be glue, glaze, gum, and grabs, caulk also, and hooks, shackles, cables, and slips, and signs so spare a child may read them. Men, women, in, out, no parking, beware the dog. In the right hands, they can work wonders. Now we think about wonders and we think about God, and we think about what all of these things are used for. They're all used to create, to build. So, so we, we have the, and the language is, is incredible. Opening their brass wings. You ever thought of that before? No. Bins of hooks glittering like bees. It's just wonderful language. But, but she looks at the hardware store and she goes, this is the center of creation. And, and of course, it's proof of the existence of God. They're pointing to Jerusalem. They're, they're pointing to you, Cross. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you, know you, can bring that, you can bring that interpretation yourself. I don't know where her hammers, wh what East is in her. OK. OK, so, but, uh, so that's the last poem that I want to talk about. But I want to go back to, I want to go here. You know. Is it clearer? And the next time you read a poem, what will catch your attention? Think about that. And do we need to talk about meaning? No. No. This is an aesthetic and emotional experience. We, it's lovely. It's wonderful. It's a Matisse collage. But, but we are pulled into it. We react to it. And here we're back to Constable. But again, what happens when you stop working for meaning and you start looking at what's exactly on the page, your experience of the poem will be totally different. And I think it's really important to think about that. We jump to meaning too fast. Once you think about the words on the page, the actual words on the page, that fish hook open eye, you don't need to think about meaning. It's already there. So your homework, <laughs> find a poetry anthology, read a poem a day. Some you will like, some you won't. But think about you, why you like one and dislike another. What are the elements that make you feel the poem? What kind of aesthetic experience does the poem give you? So I'm going to leave you with those questions, and I'm happy to entertain your questions if you want. Is it in an anthology? I think it's called The Book of Luminous Things, and, it, and it's um, edited by Miloz, the, the, the Polish um, poet. They're beautiful works in translation. Um, but any of, there are lots and lots of little poetry textbooks, um, Seagull Book of Poems, 250 um, Common Poems, any of those um, are, are good places to start. Um, yes? How do you get your students to slow down when they read a poem? How do you get them to just not worry about the meaning, what it means, but think about what it does? I do exactly this. I, I read it out loud. I make them read it out loud. Um, I talk about the words on the page. A couple of my students are here. Carly, how do I make you appreciate poems? Oh. <laughs>
This is the most I've ever seen her talk in one sitting. Because, <laughs> no, I'm being honest here because she'll ask you, she'll give you a very specific but such a broad question at the same time. It's like, it like just irks at you a little bit each question that she asks, and then you're like, but, but I'm angry about this poem. And she's like, all right now. Now where, can you point to me where you're angry about it? And it's, and then I'm like, well, I'm angry about this line. It's making me angry. And then she's like, okay. Because you know, like, like, being in class with her, I was notorious for just being like, I hate this. And she's like, well, you need to say why. And she would have, and she was not, it was a big thing to reread a poem. Because a lot of times when you're studying a lot of, when you're doing a lot of reading in class, you just like try and breeze through it, and you can't just breeze through poetry. <laughs> yeah. Do you like poetry better after taking your class? Oh yeah, I like literature a lot more after taking. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's a plant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A lot of these poems, and uh, that ties to Susie's presentation earlier, are very cultural. Yes. Me sitting here. Um, not, I can't relate to many of the metaphors because I grew up in Israel uh -huh. and the metaphors in the poetry, a lot of them you showed us, don't mean anything to me. I can't translate them into the original meaning. So poetry is really culturally specific and if we increase our diversity, what are we going to do about our poetry? Um, <laughs> that's a wonderful question. That is truly a wonderful question because, just a second, um, translation is very, very difficult. Um, but, but poets try to do it because try, poets try to put into words what can't be put into words. Um, and there are some people who are very good at it. Um, but but what, what do we lose? Or what do people not understand? This is, a, this is really important. Um, I chose these particular poems because they were, they were good for the points I wanted to make. Um, but let's think about Shakespeare. Shakespeare's been translated into everything, including Klingon. <laughs> um, what happens to the poetry in Shakespeare if we translate it? Um, so, so this is really important. But we, we need to get as close as we can. There's some some, I mean, I don't speak any language other than English with any fluency, but I really do enjoy reading poems that are translated. Um, you know, Neruda comes to mind, um, but, um, but there's some Middle Eastern poets who, you know, it's, it's hard, it's not quite right, but it's close as we can get. Mm -hmm. And I think poetry can be, can be a medium for bringing people together. Very much so. Yes? The cultural side of it can be greatly enhanced if you learn a second language. And Absolutely. if you pick up the second language, you also pick up the aspects of that culture. Yes. And Not necessarily. Yeah. Well, it's very difficult, but in Spanish, there are two words that mean to be. One for permanent states and one for impermanent states. Ser is permanent, estar is for impermanent. But in Spanish, if you're talking about death, you use a star, esta muerta, she is dead. Wait a minute, death's an impermanent state? What? But, but in Hispanic cultures, the veil between life and death is much thinner, much thinner than it is for us. And so I cannot express that concept of impermanent death in English. Can't do it. We don't have the tools. So how do we, how do, we do that? Um, it's, it's, speaking another language is, is really important. Yes? My daughter and I taught Spanish, and one of the things we did was to translate tunes and songs that were American into Spanish. And a lot of times it, the, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And that made me think the same thing, because the words are so different, mm -hmm. that it, it made me think in the same terms, poetry, with the cadence and certain things would be very hard to translate unless you do have some knowledge of that language. I wrote some poems in Spanish when I was studying Spanish and then translated them into English. And I wrote a poem called Las Abuelas, which is the grandmothers. Well, the grandmothers is not pretty. 
is not a nice, it's, you know, I have no problem with grandmothers, but the sound is not pretty. <laughs> I am one. Um, but the sound is not pretty. Las Abuelas is gorgeous. So how do I capture that poetry of Las Abuelas in a title of a poem in English? And what I did was I translated it to our mother's mothers, which isn't exact, but, but, I, but I was working for sound. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. This was great.